Greetings, everyone. I am thrilled and honored today to be in conversation with Dr. Elizabeth Satoris, and I'm going to give a brief bio and then we'll launch into conversation together. But thank you for doing this and being here today. Aloha. <laughs> so uh, she is an internationally known evolution biologist, futurist, speaker, author, and sustainability consultant to businesses, government agencies, and other organizations. She is a U.S. and Greek citizen who's lived in the U.S., Canada, Greece, Peru, and Spain, while lecturing, doing workshops, and media appearances on all continents. She's a member of the Evolutionary Leaders, a founding member of Rising Women, Rising World, and has co convene two international symposia on the foundations of science. She's also been a professor in residence at the Chaminade University, and she's appeared in numerous films and is author of the books, Earth Dance, Living Systems in Evolution, A Walk Through Time, From Stardust to Us, Biology Revisioned with Willis Harmon, and a new ebook, Gaia's Dance. And I'll put your more full bio and website below. But it, it's extraordinary what you've done. And I've been profoundly influenced by your work since reading Earth Dance. And one of the things that I think is extraordinary is you're an amazing integrative thinker weaving together ancient wisdom with an incredible vision for who we can become moving into the new paradigms that we're all needing to move into on the planet. So thank you for all the work that you do. Mahalo. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to start with your um, talking about the importance of story. Um, a quote from one of your articles that really impacted me was your line, conscious creation through changing our stories, our beliefs, becomes the means by which we change ourselves. And some of what's really powerful in your work is you help us to understand the stories that we've been telling ourselves about ourselves, about our relationship with the earth, particularly that understanding of Darwinian evolution and how destructive that's been and how we need to change that story to move into a right relationship with each other and with the earth and with our understanding of our place in the cosmos. So can you say a little bit more about that? Yes, I think the fact that we are storytelling creatures is one of the main things that distinguishes us from the other creatures, <laughs> from the uh, other evolved mammals. Um, although we don't know uh, how much the whales are telling stories to each other and things like that. You know, it's, it's amazing that we seem to know more about other planets by now than some things about our own planet. Anyway, we have been storytellers from the get-go and everybody has a worldview. I used to teach workshops on this because not everybody recognizes that they have a worldview. Your worldview is what I like to call your garden of beliefs about who you are and how you relate to the, the cosmos, to the planet, the other beings of the earth, your fellow creatures, um, all of those beliefs. In a workshop, I would ask people to say, what did you believe about higher powers, about uh, the nature of humans, things like that, when you were 10 years old, when you were 20, when you were 30, um, to, to get people to understand that we grow these beliefs like plants in a garden mm. and we weed them out. Sometimes we stop believing something. We, we don't believe it anymore. And we plant new beliefs and we rearrange things to make sense of them. So uh, it's very important for people to know this because we live by those beliefs. All our actions are guided by what we believe, our context uh, for example, a rose is not as a rose as a rose as a rose. No, a rose is very different to a donkey, to a perfume maker, to a lover, 
to, you know, there are all kinds of ways to see a rose in different contexts. And I have sometimes called myself a context chaser, because if you look, keep looking for the next bigger context, you end up with the whole universe. And my son mm -hmm. used to say, why do you have to talk about the whole universe when you're trying to describe something? I said, I don't know. I'm a context chaser. <laughs> right? And I'm aware of how much meaning comes from the context. Look at the two political parties. They have different stories about who we are and what we want to see in our world, how we want to organize ourselves. And so the, everything that they do and act on is within the context of that belief system. So uh, it's, it's a wonderful, fun thing to understand. But once you get it, then you can think about where did I get this belief? Start asking yourself, did this come from my parents, from my schoolmates, from the movies? You know, uh, be aware, where did you get the belief and what makes you still hold it? Or why did you drop that belief? These are all very interesting questions for storytelling creatures. But we not only have these individual worldviews, but there are whole cultural worldviews. And that's what you're getting at when you say, Darwinian evolution has been taught to us as the way things really are, because we replaced religious authorities with scientific authorities, and the scientific authorities took up the Darwinian story. And now we know that the competitive uh, nature of beings in nature is only a youthful phase that precedes a much more important cooperative mature phase. And we also see that the selection in nature is among individuals only up to where they start to form communities. And as soon as they start forming bacterial communities way back when, and our communities as we know them now, nature selected for the most internally cooperative communities rather than the most competitive individuals, it's about the most internally cooperative communities. So each of our bodies is a community of some 50 trillion cells, each of which is as complex as a large human city. And we can learn all sorts of things from our bodies about how to do really good economics and politics and all those things. It's the kind of thing that can change your story. It certainly changed mine once I recognized that vast importance of cooperation and seeing that we are now in a transition between stories where we have to move from 6,000 more or less years of empire building for which the Darwinian competition served that model and moving into a cooperative self-organizing living system kind of self-governance that we really want in the future. Part of what's extraordinary, and you and I have talked about this, is you're a double Aquarian. So <laughs> you really understand from that astrological perspective, the paradigms of the Aquarian age that we're moving into. And you, you really have a deep understanding of these larger cycles of human history that we've been through. I mean, you and I talked in an earlier conversation about our understanding of archaeologist Gimbutas's work and some of the understanding of these ancient cultures that understood cooperation, how to live in harmony, right balance with the natural world. But as you're saying in the last several thousand years that we've been in the empire building phase, we've been in a process of disconnection from the earth and from that cooperative model and in more of that competitive model to the point of taking ourselves to the brink of destruction. So we're needing mm -hmm. to deconstruct that story and paradigm and move into a radically new old story. Yes, it's, it's interesting. There's a, a new book called The Dawn of Everything that chases uh, human history way back to the beginnings and shows that we tend to think of this linear progression uh, from tribal to agriculture to urban development and empire building uh, as, a, as a linear sequence for all humanity. And therefore we consider indigenous people still 
backward, right? And okay. this this book trans uh, traces the history, and it seems that we we've, we've always, from way back then, had both egalitarian, self organizing, cooperative communities and top down command and control kinds of communities. Even when they were at a small scale, you had both of these going on all over the world and morphing into each other and, or, you know, it, it's a more complex trajectory. But we do have a long history of people working out cooperative models. And it's because they didn't divorce themselves from nature, because they stayed close. I think that uh, our problems came in well, the earliest agriculture from my perspective was spitting pits agriculture, which meant you were <laughs> moving through the paths in the forest, uh, you know, picking fruit and eating and, and then spitting the pits along the path. Now I understand what you mean. Well, you may have carried fruit from some other part of your territory with you, but now you're growing it in the new territory by spitting pits, right? Just as I think uh, cooking probably began by the good smell of a roast pig after a forest fire. You know? <laughs> now, mm, that, that's, that's better than tearing it off the bone raw. You know? <laughs> it's softer and easy to get at and something about it smells good. So uh, I, I like to think about what, what is our trajectory? What was it? How did we manage? And I think the, the first mistakes that we made was when we started, uh, instead of spitting pits along the pathway, spitting, you know, planting seeds in places where we then started to put fences around them. And fences was our first big mistake because we started to, uh, we turned that into property ownership to think that we can divide the land of our mother earth into per pieces that I own it, you don't. I decide whether you can come here or not, which was the first great inequality in a sense uh, for a whole society. And uh, anyway, it's, it's just fun to track these trajectories and to see how important cooperation is and to recognize that we humans are a social species. And uh, um, this is now really coming out strongly. Um, I'm just trying to think of her name, um, Wooly Barker. Tamsin Wooly Barker uh, has pointed out that there are only six species in evolution that have become true social species, meaning they live together in hives by the millions, you know, lots of them. Uh, and four of them are the social insects that we know, like the ants and the bees and the termites and the wasps, I think it is. Um, and then there are only two others, both mammalian. And one of them, no one will ever guess because they hide so well. <laughs> They're called blind mole rats and they live underground in cities of millions, very organized. <laughs> And termites, of course, build mounds that are air conditioned and have millions of termites working as a community. And the sixth one is us. And that is why we evolved cities out of our hamlets and towns. We grew them into cities where we live all day cooperatively, stopping at red lights, paying at the supermarket, not hitting each other in the streets. Uh, you know, all day long, we're doing cooperative things. And it's never mentioned in evolution biology. Isn't that really weird? <laughs> That's really interesting. It, uh, you know, there are a few other things science seems to have, have missed that are very fundamental, such as that it's always now. And that everything that we know and perceive and experience is all coming through our consciousness. <laughs> well, speaking of that, talk about your keyboard image because I think that is really, I would really love valuable. Yes, this is something that uh, it, it, it's always been sort of gelling in me, but recently I really fleshed this out that when you're, my job on the planet is making complex things as simple as possible, right? And so uh, in thinking about I had, I had uh, organized a couple of symposia on the foundations of science, recognizing that Western science that I was trained in is not the only science on the planet, that other cultures evolved sciences as well. 
that there was ancient Taoist science in China and that there was Islamic science in the Middle East. And, and uh, um, you know, we, we Vedic science in India and the quantum physicists in Western science, when they broke through matter into what we came to know as pure consciousness, had no way of explaining their findings within the scientific worldview they had been taught because every science has to have some idea what the universe it studies is. You can't make a theory in a vacuum. So you can't make a theory about a universe if you have no idea what a universe is, right? So Western science, for instance, says the universe is all everything that we can perceive and it is made of matter. And then they uh, figured out how to measure energy. So energy came into that picture. And, uh, and they decreed that to be real, something had to be measurable with physical instruments. That's the only kind we can use, have, make, invent, and use. And so, but then I, when I held the uh, science symposia, uh, for instance, the first one was with people who had adopted what we call the paradigm shift that came out of quantum theory, which the fathers of the founding scientists, physicists of quantum theory, turned to Vedic science because their Western science couldn't explain their findings, which is rooted in consciousness, right? So uh, beautiful. Like when, when trying to figure out, you know, how do I explain the whole universe or even a person? What are you? Are you really a body with a mind and a soul? Or are you a body, mind, soul? Are, is this an integrated whole? So I thought of the idea of what one Einstein talked about, the fundamental nature of the universe somehow being vibrations. And he, of course, is part of the standard model physics. And then the quantum theorists came along and they all agreed that the universe is made of vibrations and we're trying to get into these waves to understand them and even particles, maybe condensed waves. So I said, okay, if we're going to talk about a universe made of waves, frequencies, let's think of a piano keyboard and extend it infinitely far into the high keys and down as far as we can into low keys. And now picture that keyboard with matter in the low keys, energy like electromagnetic energy in the as you go up the keyboard. And then, so that's more rarefied. You can't see energy. You can feel and, and see matter. You can feel some energy, but you can't see any of it. And then you get up the keyboard, the vibrations get higher and higher frequencies until you're in mind, soul, whatever you want to call it, consciousness. So all of these waves, these frequency happening within a sea of what we can call cosmic consciousness or God or all that is, or you know whatever your name for the source of all these vibrations and effects is, then you can see that Western science, because it started studying the universe from the low end, from the world of matter, they didn't even, they thought electromagnetic energy was woo-woo stage stuff until they got to measure some aspects of it. And then it came into the Western science worldview. But their physical instruments can't measure anything higher. So the, is the Eastern sciences like Taoism and Vedic uh, started at the other end of the keyboard in the high frequencies of cosmic consciousness and just derived the entire keyboard with this concept of slowing down the vibrations. So Taoist uh, science, for instance, has as its premise that the universe is made up of matter, energy, and spirit. Mm. Uh, and so you can tack that right onto the keyboard, fits, and, and you can see that they understood all of it. So we can see that Eastern sciences were able to grok more of the, the whole and, and West, but Western science has worked out more details about the physical world since that was their domain. So it's important to recognize that there's no more one true science than there's one true religion. And that each one of them has its own story as we were just talking about stories. And that if we could have something like a global parliament of religion, of uh, 
we have a global parliament of religions or the parliament of global religions, I think it's called. Why can't we have a global consortium of sciences, which would give us a kind of checks and balances among the beliefs of Islamic science turns out to be a science of a living universe. So I had Western science as a material universe and Vedic Eastern Taoist science as a, well, Vedic as a consciousness, Taoist as one that talks about how do people fit into nature. And then we have um, Islamic science with its first premise, Allah created the universe, as you'd expect. The second one in their foundational story is Allah created a living universe and told us to study it. So oh, we'll be now I had a living universe, right? So this was wonderful. Why can't they all get together so that when Western science wants to put toxins into nature, Islamic science can come say, eh, you're going to get into trouble. You know, we shouldn't be using toxins. Can't we figure out a way to make more natural whatever that is that's toxic? When they talk about a living universe, does that mean a sentient conscious universe in Islamic science? I, I haven't gotten into all the details, but I loved working. Uh, that one was held in Kuala Lumpur. And I have to say the Islamic male scientists gave me more respect than I ever had from scientists in my own culture because I was swimming upstream uh, in their worldview <laughs> against their own basic premises. Whereas Islamic science was open to this and they found it fascinating and both the women and the men would be at these symposia. Uh, I went there for other than the symposium, I ended up as a visiting lecturer at the University of Malaya. And uh, uh, I'm amazed at some of the things I said in that context that I thought might have offended them. <laughs> um, I think I, I once talked about being in a sweat lodge with my bare butt on the ground. And then when I replayed it, I thought, <laughs> did I really say that? <laughs> that was great. Like, <laughs> but nobody called me on it and nobody walked out. <laughs> you know, what's beautiful in what you're describing is it's like that understanding that we need to come to in religion, that there is no one truth. I like to think about, you know, the different religions as, you know, if you think of light going through a prism, some people may see green, others may see orange or, but it's all part of the light. But where we get into trouble is when we say, oh no, it's green only or mm -hmm. orange only. Yes. Part of what you're talking about is the need for science yes. to see that same range of stories and beliefs and perspectives about their understanding of the universe, rather than saying this is the one true way. Exactly, my way or the highway kind of thing. Yeah. And, and that's a, just it, that the parliament of uh, world or global religions, world religions, I think it is, uh, which was headed by my dear friend, Audrey Kitagawa for years until very recently, uh, that they they got to understand by dialoguing peacefully with each other, they could recognize the common essence in all the religions and be tolerant, which is preached in most religions, do talk about tolerance being important, right? And they so they were able to practice it on the common ethics of tolerance and the understanding of one source essence that can have different names, but be the same source essence. Uh, we can call cosmic consciousness God. We can call it all that is. We can call it whatever we want. We call it Uncle George, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, and what you're talking about, too, I think with all the great religions, they all have very similar mystical roots where yes. things begin to differentiate is when they start institutionalizing a belief system and the doctrines. But, you know, the same thing, you know, part of what you're talking about with science is, and the keyboard, which I love, it's that understanding that everything is interconnected and we can come at it from a different perspective, but it's all part of the whole. And where I think Western scientists can get in trouble is when they stay caught in that sense of the materialist view of the universe. And the sense that if it's not visible, it's not real, when only 4% <laughs> of the universe is visible, is visible yes. matter. Yes. 
So then you're ignoring 96% of the universe. Exactly. And uh, it's, it's just all so fascinating, isn't it? And, and of course, there are all the indigenous sciences too, um, that each different indigenous cultures had different creation stories, and yet they have commonalities and, and often very common ethics. And I think for our future world, uh, what will unite us is values, ethics. Uh, if we can agree that we don't want to harm nature and that we don't want to harm each other and, you know, have that common base for it, then it doesn't matter. It should look different in different places in the world, through different languages, through different cultures. So, uh, so all these sciences, you know, theoretically, they could be meeting just the way the religions do. You know, religion gets its knowledge through the inner channels. And science gets its information through the outer, the outer, the perception of the outer world, right? So that has been mostly, it's been divided that way. And yet the religions are now accepting evolution as a scientific story into their worldview. And on the other hand, science, some scientists are accepting uh, cosmic consciousness as a source field. Uh, so they're coming together. It, it's, it's, it's inevitable that we understand we're all part of the same universe and we reflected by being body, mind, spirits ourselves rather than bodies with a mind. And I think uh, one of the, the really fun things about the keyboard to me is for people who are interested in UFOs, in uh, visitations from outer space, uh, there are so many stories of UFOs that pilots and airplanes have been followed by or have been tracking and or people looking up and seeing a UFO and suddenly it disappears. How is that possible? Well, think about the keyboard. How about a civilization whose story is the whole keyboard and has learned to integrate into consciousness and its material technology? such that it can slide up and down the keyboard to get out of the way of our weapons. Because while the UFO is a physical, it can be shot down by physical weapons. But if they slide up the keyboard, they become invisible to us <laughs> and they can't be shot at anymore. So I love that aspect of it. I, when I was living in the Peruvian Andes, most of the people there believed in aliens because they had this experience of, of the ships coming and, and the ships uh, hiding themselves under glaciers and things. You could see the lights through the ice. You see, you can do that in the non-material realm. <laughs> uh, and they called them the doctors because they seemed to always be wearing white and they could fix trucks and human beings equally well. <laughs> and so, so this was part of life up there, right? Mm -hmm. And I reckon that's one of the places that such ships would should land if they have any sense. And I just reckon they have a lot of sense because the people were friendly. <laughs> no one was shooting at them. Uh, so it's, it's a safe place on our planet to be in indigenous territories, you know, where... Uh, they can be far away from big weaponry and stuff like that. Sorry, I'm kind of ranting. <laughs> no, this is this is beautiful. And, you know, it's interesting in what you're saying and in what you were talking about earlier, you know, so much of the paradigm of the Aquarian age is about mm. coming back into connection, into cooperation, into a new sense of community with each other and the acceptance of diversity within the context of community, which is exactly what you're describing. And one of the things that you talk about in your articles too is the importance for us of using nature as a role model. Yes. And nature, Mother Earth, shows us how to have biodiversity, diversity in the midst of cooperative interconnectedness and interdependence. And my sense is that some of these advanced cultures from other parts of the galaxy have learned that. And we on earth can't really become more full citizens of the galaxy until yes. we learn that lesson. Otherwise, we're a, not, only, not only are we 
an incredible danger on the earth and we've mm -hmm. triggered the sixth mass extinction on the planet, yes. but we'll take that destructive energy out into the galaxy, into the universe, if we don't learn those lessons. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and uh, many people who have had encounters have said they're warning us not to trash our planet. Uh, and that's one of the main reasons why they come down to, and try to commune with some of the, I say commune, because uh, it's people who can accept the direct transmission of knowledge, oh, who, can, who can have dialogue with them. Uh, and communion is is belongs to the higher frequencies where communication through language belongs further down and uh and and i know uh i know one person personally who was actually taught to what used to be taken out onto these flying saucers and was taught to fly one and he and others that i later ran into through research were all to, it said they connected my mind to the physical ship in such a way that I became the ship and could steer it with my mind. And so I know that all the reverse engineering that's going on uh, in our dark governance world uh, will never succeed because they don't have a clue to what that would mean. So they, they may be able to reverse engineer the hardware, but they're never going to get them to fly. <laughs> So, because they don't understand the whole keyboard. And that's why it's so critical. And yes, we can learn from nature everything we need to know about politics and economics, for example, uh, which I know you're interested in. Um, I know of no indigenous culture that ever used the vote to make decisions. The Haudenosaunee, whom we call the Iroquois, from the... Uh, Northeast United States into Canada, that kind of area where I grew up in Mohawk territory, had united six nations under a great law of peace. And they truly had uh, a civilization that was by the people, of the people, for the people, in ways where grandmothers chose chiefs and could depose them if they weren't serving their people. And uh, and men had to wear a skirt into parliament and carry corn grinding bowl to propose war, to remind people what would happen to the food supply and the women and the children. And so they had a thousand years of peace until the uh, Europeans came along and Ben Franklin made friends with them and learned these things. So we have practiced at that scale already to build cooperative societies. But the reason I brought it up was because of the vote. And when we talk now about how to save our democracy, I'm in dialogue with a lot of people now about what do we mean by a democracy and what do we want to keep? The first uh, democracy in ancient Greece, of course, wasn't a democracy at all. It left out about three quarters of the people. Half the people were women and, and about a quarter were slaves and neither of those were part of it, but they did immediately use the vote to make decisions. And as we all know, a vote can leave out almost half of the population voting. Uh, so it never can represent all the people unless they vote 100% for the same thing. And so when we every four years make a decision to have either a conservative party or a radical party, let's say a progressive party, that doesn't make any sense in nature because nature mm. is profoundly conservative with things that work and radically changes the things that don't work. And that is going on 24 seven in every ecosystem in your own body. There is dialogue instead of voting to reach consensus. Mm. Now, the way it works is think holarchy where you start with, let's say, start at a cell, which is already as complex as a large human city, but a cell within an organ, organ system, body, bodies in family, community, ecosystem, nations, all the way up to the context chasing universe, right? Um, so what happens is that every level of any holarchy, whether it's the holarchy of your body, of your community, of whatever, must meet its self-interest. A couple is a two-level holarchy. Each person in it is at one level is two individuals, and the next level is couplehood. Mm. Everything you decide 
in your marriage or whatever your partnership is about has to be agreed upon. So if one person wants one thing and the other works the other, there's some kind of concession has to be made or you have to make a third decision amenable to both. In other words, self-interest must not become selfishness. Mm. When it's selfishness in your body, it's a cancer. It means that the cells are no longer in dialogue with all the other cells, that they're only saying my way or the highway and proliferating on their own without regard to the well-being of the larger context, the, the bigger holon that they're embedded in. So you can see just how it functions, how a cancer functions and why humans are starting to behave like a cancer on the earth. Because yes. we're only interested in our human well-being and not in anyone else's, right? Yes. And so, and what you're describing too is a sense then of separating yes. the self, like the cancer cells separate from exactly. the interconnectedness or the that's harmonic yeah. with that, the whole body. That separation leads to selfishness instead yeah. of self-interest. You have to be fed as a person. You know, you have to have shelter, you have to have health. Uh, you need the wherewithal to produce those things, but you're doing it always in context of a larger community that provides those things you need. And if you can recognize that we don't want to be either communists or capitalists, we don't want to do the feisty competitive me first and me only kind of thing, and we don't want to submerge our individuality in into a, a sludge. I remember some islanders... Uh, in, in Asia, we're saying we don't want to, we want to maintain our different flavors and colors uh, as people, different ethnicities. We don't, we want to, how did they say, we're willing to be a fruit salad, but not marmalade, kind of. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but again, it's diversity in the context of unity. Exactly. It is yeah. diversity and unity. And it's always the dialogue between the individual and the collective. Now, I've been through lots of meetings with Indigenous people. And if you don't want to sit up the whole night to <laughs> repeat the on something, you start giving a little. Without losing your self-interest, you make more concession to whatever the other people want in, in community because they're all looking at, they need to meet their self-interest too. But they're so, also looking at the seven generations most of the time too. So again, rather than, I mean, so much of our modern politics is driven by the crisis in the moment yes. rather than that bigger view of what's really going to be in the best interests of future generations. Absolutely. But but so first of all, we have to recognize that in our democracy, if if we can call it that, it's more like a mask on corporatocracy at this point. It's what we preach to the world that we are, but it's not what we're acting as. Yes. We are the most violent here in the United States. We're the most violent nation in the world. We have military bases in 83 countries, whereas Russia has only three and China one. Or, or the other way around, that's the max of our arch enemies. And so uh, we don't get what we have become and we don't get that maybe voting is not something we want to take into the future. In Canada, there was an experiment where they randomly picked 10 people from across the country from different walks of life and they had them work out major decisions that were confronting the government. And they found that those 10 people together in circle made as good decisions as the government. <laughs> uh, you know, we're capable of cooperation. We're capable of understanding the issues facing us. And in our bodies, constantly, all the cells are in communion with the organ, with the organ system. If part of your body gets hurt, you just break a leg or, 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 or cut yourself. None of the cells are saying, don't send extra resources there because they know <laughs> that the body has to stay healthy as a whole for them to flourish themselves. So we have, we have ethics. We have, uh, imagine that you're going to do world economics in your body. And uh, so you, your, your northern organs, uh, the heart-lung system up here, uh, and, and then all of the blood cells, uh, are made in, in the marrow bones all over the body. And then that, that bone marrow 
uh, stem cell gets turned into an almost blood cell and gets swept up into the heart lung system. And in the lungs, the, the oxygen is added and then it, it ends up in the circulation of the blood. Imagine the heart now as the distribution center of that blood, announcing the body price for blood is so much. Who wants? Mm. Just mm. think, what would that do to the economy if some of the cells couldn't afford it? And, <laughs> right. So you know, the, this is, yeah. these are nature models, right? <laughs> well, the other thing that you're talking about, which so correlates with your keyboard imagery, is the, the and, and I love this principle that, that I, I know is in ancient cultures, like in ancient Egypt, the understanding of ma'at, which means everything is meant to be in right relationship and right balance with everything else. So the keyboard is also about things need to be in harmony harmony with each other because then everything thrives mm -hmm. whereas when you're in that competitive model some thrive and others uh, are barely able to survive exactly exactly and that's what uh there are such wonderful role models in in the world um besides all these things we can learn from nature i'll just say one more thing about ecosophy yes <laughs> I, I was just going to ask you to talk about it, that you read an article on mine called Com Com ecosophy and uh, you're ha perfectly uh happy to have you put the link to that article and to the cells and cities article uh so that people can have the access since they're posted Beautiful. on the web um but the idea is that uh Think about economy and ecology. We know what that ecology is uh, about nature and that economics is about what we do with nature, how we transform it to our use. Uh, but the two words come from the ancient Greek word ekos, which is household. And they saw household as a holarchy from family to community all the way up to the gods and what they were doing in the sky and uh, things like that. So um, the ecology is ecos put together with logos, which is the design. The design of the household is our ecology. And the economy is the nomos with ecos, nomos meaning law, the rule, how you run it, right? How it's, how it's designed and how you run it, how it's organized and how it functions. Uh, and you say, why would you take those apart <laughs> to start with? Uh, can you do that? Can you take them apart? Can you talk about politics without economics when most, ec most politics are about economics, like right. World Trade Organization rules, all those things? Anyway, what we've done is we've made the ecology subservient to our economy. We've put the economy on top and we've seen the ecology as a set of resources for human consumption. And that's where our problem lies. Flip that over and fit your economy into nature, into the ecology, and you have what I call an ecosophy, which is the household with the word Sophia for wisdom, the wise household. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of my making complex things simple to understand that we must in future fit, have politics that let us fit our economics into nature. That's where we have to go in the future. So um, that said, we have role models in the world. We could talk about some of the communities who are practicing a better kind of self-governance. Oh, say more about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, my favorite uh, rural community is called the Sarvodaya movement, Sarvodaya, S-A-R-V-O-D-A-Y-A, and that's in Sri Lanka. And it has brought together uh, something like 10,000 little hamlets and villages, it's a big island, uh, in self-organizing, bootstrapping their little local economies bank books with pennies in them that you uh, you are taught can be lent out to others while you don't need them to build some, buy some farm machine or something. Anyway, the young people, the children, the first thing they are taught in the Sarvadiya movement among those people is to, uh, to meditate on inner peace and generosity. Wow. wow. Just those two principles. 
Imagine a world in which everyone is a peaceful person focused on what they have to give to others. Do you need any other rules? Beautiful. <laughs> and then there's, and that, that was founded by Dr. Uh, Arya Ratne, whom I met many years ago, and I got to go to uh, Sri Lanka for a, a conscious clothing uh, conference and visit him in his home and and now his son Vinya has taken it over. Um, uh, that's a rural cooperative society. My favorite urban cooperative society is Mondragon in Basque, Spain, like My Dragon in French, M-O-N Dragon, right? <laughs> um, that is a community that was started by uh, a Catholic priest many years, maybe 50 years ago or so, who wanted to build a new human society and wanted the young people to get interested in doing that. So he went around to bars or wherever the young people were hanging out and said, what if we built a society that wasn't communist or capitalist, but based on loving human relationships? Mm. And he had them work on it and work on it and work on it. And they made the basic rules, for instance, that no one could earn more than six times the lowest salary in this urban cooperative, that everybody had to come into ownership of whatever the, the uh, uh, production and distribution system was, that wherever they worked, they should be part owners. So if someone came to work in a place, part of their salary, a little bit of it would go into their ownership pool until they had their shares in it. And uh, it works. And during the 2008 crisis, they survived much better than the rest of Spain and the world uh, because they had their own bank that was based on their principles. And whenever somebody had to be laid off during such a recession, they would still get, um, I think, 80% of their salary, something like a lot of their salary, they would maintain and free job training for doing something else in the culture. Everyone is always cared for. No one is ever left out, right? And yet they have a society in which people do earn a living and, and they do have jobs and, uh, you know, and they build industrial things like uh, uh, refrigerators and washers and buses. And I think they build bridges and they're economically very viable in Europe. So we know that those are two examples. Then we have a whole chain of the global eco village network and we have the Fintorns and the- And the uh, transitional communities. Yeah. But and what you're describing too is these are all right. grassroots efforts. Exactly, you got it. That aren't they, coming from a top down or a governmental- no, They are bottom right. up. And, and so I like to say, by the people, we will not get the new world in a phoenix from the ash, rising from the ashes model. We're more likely to get it from the caterpillar into butterfly model, yes. where the where the uh, imaginal cells are coming out of the walls of the old chrysalis hardened walls of the caterpillar has been housing these what we would call stem cells. Scientists call them imaginal cells because they're going to build the imago. It, had, it wasn't about imagination, <laughs> but it can be in the metaphor. Uh, they come out of the walls of where they've always been throughout the life of the caterpillar. It was a mix and match kind of animal, uh, as Lynn Margulis taught us so much about mixing and matching in evolution and talk about cooperation uh, clams that keep uh, green cells that can uh, make sunlight uh, into sugars, you know, uh, through photosynthesis. And, and still it's a clam, which is very different from a photosynthesizing plant, and but it's one being. So we have these examples in nature and we have uh, all of this, these, these communities that are trying this out from the grassroots. So I say, you know, there, there is a empire building is in its last gasp. There are people in the world um, who are trying to build a new transhumanist society based on you have an iPhone, you'll be happy without uh, having owning anything. 
and everything will be Great reset. Be paid through it, depending on your social credit score. And they're, they've already uh, rolled this out in Ukraine in the middle of a war, which I find so cynically ugly, uh, so that people who have submitted to vaccination can get government currency to buy food and medicine, and those who don't want to get the jab uh, have no access to it. And so they're they're playing with this two-tiered society, how to divide the people into those who do what we want and those who do, don't do what we want. Um, and that is a real empire building mode and it involves China and it involves Russia and the poor Ukrainian people are stuck between a war that's basically between the East and the West and the US has long had its bioweapons labs in Ukraine and we have other interests there. <laughs> Uh, and it's where Chernobyl happened. And um, so we we cannot stop them from doing what they're doing. We must allow the empires. We know they're unsustainable, which means cannot last. We know they will implode under their own weight, unsustainable. And our job is to build the new grassroots self-organizing communities in the cracks of the concrete, right? As, oh, beautifully as said. <laughs> beautifully said. And I think you're describing, you know, and, and this I know from an astrological perspective that when we're in this kind of profound shift, not just from one astrological age to the next, but we're at the end of a 24,000 year processional cycle into a new one, that you're mm. so describing that, and, and you talk about this in terms of evolution biology, it's a time for an evolutionary leap. This, this shift isn't going to come from incremental change. It will be a no. metamorphosis like the butterfly. Yes. I mean, the caterpillar becoming the butterfly. And I think the other thing you're saying that's so important is we need to be aware of our own consciousness, the stories that we're telling ourselves, and how do we hold that hope and that sense of the new paradigm and what we're capable of moving into rather than getting caught in the turmoil of the last gasp of the empires. Yes. And I mean, it doesn't mean that we should stop voting or that we, you know, we, uh, we need to try to elect younger politicians who really get uh, the green meme or whatever you want to call it, uh, that we need to be sustainable in our future, that we have to build a culture based on caring and sharing. And it's my favorite thing about the COVID years is that we elevated caregivers to heroic status. Mm. That's very, very important. And we also learned that when we lock up the humans, nature <laughs> revives very quickly. How <laughs> yes. fast the skies cleared and yes. the animals came yes. out and all of those yes. things. So that we can see, we, we had some lessons in our human impact and how we can change it rather quickly. And evolution does not proceed in slow, gradual, linear changes, any more than the sea level is going to rise in slow, a few millimeters at a time. So you can say, well, by 2080, it'll be uh, a foot and a half high. And no, it's going to come in fits and starts also. A big tsunami will hit your shore. We just had one in Hawaii that washed over two-story buildings as wow. the wave came in. Over two-story buildings. Wow. The water came over the top of them, right? Uh, when those tsunami, when they are actual, those were just big waves. We have big waves occasionally here. <laughs> but when the tsunamis hit, when they go out, they may leave a meter or two higher water suddenly overnight. This can happen. I learned this from Jim Hansen, the best uh, climatologist we have now. And he stood in the streets of Tokyo with me many years ago and said, imagine the water up to the 15th floor of these buildings. And this is on the real side, sandbagging ain't gonna keep it back. Um, so we have to talk not about stopping climate change any more than stopping the empire juggernaut. We have to talk about adaptation. How do we adapt? How do we use what we can of this old system of the butterfly, the caterpillar materials to build the butterfly from? Can we go into the future without ever making another piece of plastic because we have so much of it to recycle? 
uh, can we do? Can we go into the future without further mining by recycling what we have in glass and steel and all of these things? Um, you know, we have to talk about what technology transfer can we take into the future. If all the young people are busy digging themselves out of floods and fires and famines and things like that, they're not going to be on their iPhones looking for their iPay. And, mm -hmm. and what supermarket will they use that iPay in when the supermarket is gone? So we have to feed ourselves and shelter each other, feed each other, shelter each other. We're about to try to weave together the whole uh, food it's not yet a network, but all the food endeavors on our island, uh, who's, who buys the food for the, for the hotels and for the care homes and hospitals? And, and how would, do we connect them with the farmers directly, leaving out some middlemen and making other jobs in, in their place and making the whole system prosper through linking up all of these components without having it run by some top-down economy that says, you cannot subsidize a local food against an import, which is the case here in Hawaii, where we have to pay more for a local banana than for dole, which wrecked a lot of our soil and is now gone to import us the bananas from Central America at a cheaper price. Uh, and this kind of thing where countries, our, our country exports US as much steel as it imports. What's that all about? Why are we exporting as much as we import? Same with Germany and all the other countries. They're all exporting and importing the same product because the World Trade Organization is set up to move it as, as far as you can, using up the fossil fuel, all of that, you know, to make more and more money uh, from it. And again, and it's that competitive model versus a cooperative model and versus a relational model. I'd love to, before we run out of time, just hear yeah. a little bit about Rising Women, Rising World, the organization that you helped to found. Yeah. I'm afraid it didn't really go very far. We had several meetings in England. We even had a meeting in the uh, parliament in London. And we're, it's a wonderful group of women. Uh, but it did not get the support that would enable it to continue on. However, the Worldwide Indigenous Science Network is still alive, which I also was a co-founder of. And uh, uh, Tree Sisters is doing very well. And um, if I wanted to, to end on, on one note, I would tell you about uh, standing tall in your canoe. <laughs> uh, something I learned from Polynesian sailors. Um, here in Hawaii, we built a replica of the ancient uh, canoes that sailed around the whole world. Uh, two years ago, this replica of an ancient canoe sailed around the entire world. They used it, they, hundreds of years ago, they sailed to the Caribbean taking breadfruit with them so that Caribbean Islanders have breadfruit trees in their yard. Breadfruit is the most no work agriculture in the world for the most wonderful food that just drops on your head if you go to sleep under the tree. <laughs> no plowing, no nothing. And big companies are trying to patent it now, of course. But anyway, uh, the Polynesian sailors, first of all, they never uh, made rigid joints in their canoes. Everything, every part of the canoe was lashed to other parts so that it could ride the waves flexibly. Mm. And that flexibility is lesson one. Uh, the Polynesian soldiers, to uh, sailors, told me all the ways they had of reading nature in order to navigate. Besides knowing the stars, which could orient you where you were if you knew the star patterns throughout the year, the cycles, of right. the, the stars, uh, you could navigate by those. But what if it's cloudy and stormy for a couple of weeks and you can't see the stars? They had uh, patterns of fish migrations and seaweed floating and how clouds form over islands and all of these, these uh, the deep swells versus the surface waves. And, uh, and then they said, when all else fails, stand tall in your canoe until you can see your destination. And what they meant was raise your consciousness high up above. I mean, who hasn't played on a Hawaiian beach like this during a dull lecture? Don't tell me you can't move your consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> and 
So uh, what you're doing is you're taking your consciousness up to where you have a larger perspective on things. And uh, so when you feel like you're down in the bottom of a black well, you know, that everything is closing in on you, the world is going to hell in a handbasket or to pot or whatever you metaphor you use. Uh, instead, raise yourself up. I, I was feeling the weight of the world under on my back like Atlas, right? And I turned that into a hot air balloon to get it to lift me instead mm -hmm. of my lifting it. <laughs> and, um, you know, metaphors like that are important. We we put plant them in our minds and, and try to live by them and improve things in our lives. So uh, when you do that and you stand and you lift your consciousness above, look down now on the human drama playing out and see it as a necessary drama in our human evolution so that you start seeing people you think of as the bad guys as maybe having come to wake us up in one way or another and stop seeing them as enemies, but watching the flow of migrating from a top-down patriarchal empire building model into your grassroots mother nature, caring and sharing kind of world and see where were you maybe banging your head against the wall because there was no flow and where might you be able to get into the flow to move something through whatever you love doing, whether you're a musician or a techni technician or a doctor or a mother or, you know, whatever. Uh, there's room. We need that diversity. We need everybody to find out something they love doing that is going to push us in the right direction or pull us in the right direction, whether you're an attractor or a pusher. <laughs> right? Uh, and that that will give you a better outlook on it. You don't have to save the whole world. You just have to participate in this participatory living system that you're in anyway, you are participating and you have a choice. Every choice you make is part of your life, your evolution, what happens in your life. Every belief matters. So that's yeah. the way I keep my hope up. That's the way I remain an optimist. Even if the human population, let's say it was decimated by two thirds. Isn't that one third? want to be in it? That's your choice. The way to create the future you want is to start living it now. Mm -hmm. Eat the food you think people should eat in the future. Treat people the way you think people should treat each other. Start practicing all those things you want in your future world as much as possible, and things will start looking better. Oh, that is so beautiful, and it's so reflects that Hopi prophecy. We are the ones that we've been waiting for. But mm -hmm. also what you're talking about is that understanding that when we hold that higher consciousness and we are energizing this new future, we're co-creating it together. And like Rupert Sheldrake's sense of the morphogenic fields, if even a minority of us are seeding that in the collective consciousness, it will exactly. change the world. Yes. Oh, it's going to change anyway, and each of us are a <laughs> participant in its change. So let's do it in a in a happy, positive, and do it in a way that's in harmony with the evolution that Mother Earth herself is in. Yes, yes, uh, exactly. Um, she's here to teach us, and it's really fun learning from her. Mm -hmm. And we know what to do. Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you for being in this conversation and for sharing your wisdom with us. Butterfly world. <laughs> <laughs>